I was going to say good morning, but actually it's good afternoon now, isn't it? And thank you very much to the organisers for inviting me to um, speak at the conference today. I also wanted to say thank you for putting together such a fantastic programme. And as somebody who works in palliative care, I'm particularly delighted to see that we've got the whole team here and that we have specialists in palliative care. We also have people who work in treatment, our last speaker working in fetal cardiology, and most importantly, we have parents, and also, I think I heard that we had a child here earlier on, so that's fantastic to have such a, a wide range of appropriate people. I seem to have lost my connection here, so I can't see what slides I've got up, so if somebody could um, have a little look at that for me, I'd be really grateful. So, you've already heard what I do at the moment. I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm planning to talk about um, today. What I'd like to do is to talk about an educational intervention that I was involved in, in... Is somebody coming to help me with these? Sorry to interrupt, thank you. Um, that I was involved in, in order to evaluate how a particular educational intervention Improve, looked at improving access to children with palliative care um, needs. I want to define the population for neonatal palliative care because I don't think we've done that so far in the session today. So when I talk about neonatal palliative care, what I'm talking about are those children... People can't hear me? Is that better? Much clearer, thank you. <laughs> I wonder why people to... So what slide is up at the moment? That one? Okay, backwards please. Okay, thank you. So to explain what I'm going to do, defining the population to start with, I'm going to talk about... Um, Defining that by um, babies in the um, pre-birth period, the immediate period after birth, the early neonatal period, the first four weeks, and those children who have need for ongoing neonatal care. So that's what I define the neonatal palliative care period as. I'd also like to make some acknowledgements early on in my presentation to um, people that joined me in working on the study that I'm going to be talking about. So Alexander Mancini, who led the study and designed the educational intervention. Dr. Fenella Craig, who's a palliative care clinician and who led on um, setting up this idea of how we might improve access to paediatric palliative care for this particular group of patients. And Professor Myra Bluebond Langer, who led the evaluation study and is the head of the academic centre at the Louis Dundas uh, Centre. So why did we want to undertake this study? Well, as clinicians, both clinicians working in palliative care and in neonatal care, we were very well aware of the incidence of life-threatening and life-limiting conditions in the perinatal and neonatal period. We know that more children die in this period than any other period of childhood. And despite improvements, significant mortality persists, together with a growing cohort of survivors with complex needs who have an ongoing uncertain prognosis. Despite this potential role for palliative care services, referral to palliative care services remains low from this population particularly low in comparison to the paediatric population. One study in the US identified that only 24% of critically ill infants were actually referred to palliative care. We know that 98% of neonates who die do so in a hospital setting. We also are aware that neonatal staff report quite limited training and a need for education in palliative care. The lack of knowledge of services and the presumed association between palliative care and end-of-life care and the lack of active care was identified 
by these clinicians as a barrier to making referral to palliative care services. In addition, there are studies mainly carried out in the US where neonatal staff identified that education on palliative care processes would actually enhance their referral to palliative care services. And finally, and for me, most importantly, we have studies from bereaved parents who report dissatisfaction, including lack of information about choices in relation perhaps to palliative um, place of care um, for their babies after birth. And we heard some very poignant comments um, from Marty's talk about the experiences that some parents have had. So I think we could do better on that. I want to briefly talk about what I think are some of the unique issues associated with this particular population. New members of an emerging family. This population occupies a specific social position as members of an emerging family. The social implications associated with pregnancy and potential new life. We've heard from a couple of speakers already about the importance of congratulating parents about their pregnancy and the birth of their uh, baby. As healthcare professionals, we often focus on developmental achievements, and parents see developmental achievements as important, but they see them as important in the context of their child's developing personhood. I think that this group of patients, we have a very high level of prognostic uncertainty a different magnitude, I would suggest, to other palliative care populations. And Marty's talk this morning illustrated that very clearly um, to us. Extremely premature babies, babies with HIE, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Prognostic uncertainty remains problematic here. But this uncertainty runs alongside continuous technological development antenatal diagnosis of congenital abnormality, likely to result perhaps in death in utero or shortly after birth, means that we've got information and opportunities for decision making that wasn't accessible to previous generations of professionals or parents. This evolving technology also enables supportive care to be delivered in a range of settings. I'm thinking about non-invasive ventilation as one example of this. So here we have an emerging clinical subspeciality of peri and neonatal palliative care. It's not a single diagnostic category like cancer. There are a number of factors, the limits to viability of extreme prematurity, the ongoing impact of peri and neonatal loss on parents, those babies that survive the acute challenges of neonatal um, life and go on to have ongoing complex needs. These are all important parts of this speciality and therefore make a case, a very strong case, I would argue, for the need to establish specific education programs for this population rather than adding on to existing palliative care education programs and don't forget the babies. So these were some of the driving factors for the educational program that I'm going to be talking about. What we aimed to do with this neonatal project was to utilize an educational intervention to facilitate improved and earlier access to palliative care services for babies and families. We've already heard a little bit um, um, about the uh, literature, but we were also aware, as well as the lack of education, of the limited empirical research on education interventions in the NICU setting. So when you do education, what difference um, does it actually uh, make? And therefore, we included an evaluation study in our project. The aim of the evaluation study was to look at the impact of this education program on healthcare professionals' knowledge, attitudes, service utilization with respect to neonatal palliative care. We were interested in knowing what were the organizational and staff barriers to accessing neonatal palliative care? 
What were the organisational and the staff opportunities to accessing pa um, neonatal palliative care? What was the impact of the education um, uh, session on awareness, role availability, availability of um, services, of local and palliative care services to the people that attended that session? And what finally, what was the impact on attitudes, knowledge and confidence of those healthcare professionals who attended the sessions? So the programme was devised by Alex and um, uh, Fenella and was actually piloted in seven neonatal units and then adapted based on feedback. And then we rolled the programme out over a six-month period to 22 neonatal units across the Greater London region. There are actually 25 neonatal units that we contacted and invited to host a session, but only 22 were able to accommodate that. The sessions were free. Um, we helped them locally. They were advertised to staff working in neonatology, hospital and community pediatrics, antenatal care, and obstetrics. The content of the session was foundation, very straightforward. We wanted to talk about principles, we wanted to talk about the practice of neonatal palliative care and the resources. It was a four hour workshop, so very short. Each was tailored to ensure that the information and resources we talked about were specific to the geographical area of the neonatal unit. For example, the children's hospices in the local catchment area were invited to present, as were the local community paediatric palliative care services. Discussion was encouraged from participants in relation to their own experiences in delivering care. And an experienced neonatal nurse presented cases for discussion and provided a resource pack for each unit. So on to the evaluation methods that we used. Our evaluation design was a mixed methods approach. We did a pre and post survey and systematic observations of the education sessions. The survey instrument was developed in consultation with paediatric palliative care experts, a literature review, and we did face and content validity, pre-testing that with eight neonatal healthcare practitioners who weren't actually involved in the study. The questions included a mixture of multiple choice, Likert scale, and open-ended questions. And they're listed on the slide um, above. We asked participants to complete um, the questionnaire pre the session on arrival and post immediately after the session had um, completed. I'm afraid we had them as a captive audience. So um, we um, were quite successful in encouraging that. We did have some um, participants who had to leave early. Bleeps went off. People had to uh, leave and go back to um, work. And so we gave them a stamped addressed envelope and asked them to complete the sections that they could on the post questionnaire and um, mail it back to us. The questionnaires were anonymous. However, we had linked them by a number so that we could compare pre and post questionnaire um, responses from um, individuals. For the systematic observations, we observed uh, 16 of the 22 um, sessions. We had a schedule of observation to ensure consistency, and the notes were expanded immediately um, afterwards. 14 of the sessions we actually audio taped and transcribed. Now to go on to the findings. I'm going to deal with the findings of the survey to start with. We had 331 attendees. 264 completed the survey, so we had an 80% response rate. Um, we had 244 completed on the pre and 220 completed on um, the post. Six of those came in by um, mail. And so we had 200 match pre and post that we used for the comparison analysis. But just to tell you a little bit about our um, group, they were predominantly nurses, 66%, and predominantly female, 86%. 
Most of the people that attended were based in a neonatal intensive care unit, and that was six, 73%. Um, and they were very experienced in working in neonatal care. There was a range of experience, but the majority were experienced, had more than seven years experience of working in neonatal um, care. The type of neonatal care they worked in ranged from looking after babies who had very complex needs, who need continu needed continuous medical and nursing supervision, who were ventilated, those who just needed continuous supervision, and also those babies who were actually just getting ready um, to go home. So we had a very experienced cohort. However, I think you might be interested to learn that in that very experienced cohort, only 73% had ever, 73% had never made a referral to a palliative care service. One of the sets of questions we asked, let me just check, I've got the right one up there. Yep. <laughs> was about what this cohort of professionals felt confident about in um, caring for babies with palliative care needs. And as you can see, they were most confident about creating and collecting mementos of the baby. They were also confident in discussing the signs and symptoms that the baby may have during deterioration. Interestingly, less than half were confident in discussing care for a dying baby outside the NICU setting, either in a hospice setting or at home. Other areas in which they lacked confidence were in discussing sibling concerns with parents about the fact that they had a very sick neonatal um, a very sick baby um, in the neonatal unit that there was, the, was their brother or sister. As I said at the beginning, one of the reasons, driving reasons for this study was our concern about low rates of referrals. So we asked the participants before they um, uh, started the workshop to tell us a little bit about the reasons that they might consider making a referral to a palliative care service or ask somebody else in their unit to make this kind of um, uh, referral. What's interesting, I think, if we look at the driving factors to uh, referral, is top of the list comes facilitate and support care at home, provide psychological support to um, parents, and discuss with parents the option of their baby, sorry, this is missing, dying at home or in hospice, were all reasons that they would consider making a referral to palliative care. One of the things that I think is quite interesting about uh, those, if you think about it, is if you're thinking about um, facilitating and supporting care in the home setting, which is certainly one of the things um, that in the unit I work in that we're very involved in doing, that's usually going to happen after quite a prolonged admission. So that suggested to us that the planned referrals were going to come quite late on in that infant's neonatal trajectory, possibly close to um, discharge. If we look at the reasons where they were less likely to consider making a referral, if we go one up from the bottom, sorry, I can't do a pointer there, then antenatal diagnosis has come up as a reason where the few of the participants would consider making a referral to palliative care. What about why people wouldn't make a referral to palliative care? Well, the top reason for not making a referral was a presumption that referral would not be acceptable to parents. The second top reason was prognosis was uncertain. I think that um, what's quite interesting um, about um, uh, those two um, uh, comments from our um, data from our survey is that actually 
those factors were also reflected in the data that we got from our systematic observations of the discussions that participants engaged in during the education sessions. One respondent said, medical staff would feel it was too early to refer. In relation to uncertain prognosis, there we go. These are very unwell babies. They have a lot of operation. We don't know what's going to happen, and things can happen very fast. How do you approach parents about palliative care when you don't know the outcome yourself? Uncertain prognosis is not just a problem, obviously, for parents. It's a problem for us as healthcare professionals. What's also interesting is issues related to healthcare professionals' perception of parental attitudes to palliative care, about destroying parental hope by making referral to palliative care. As one physician said, I wimp out. You've already said their child's going to be severely ill and life-limited. It's so hard to go one step further. So some of this data relates to professional roles and responsibilities. How those healthcare professionals saw themselves and their role in caring for very sick um, babies. And I think some of our observational data provided some further insights into the barriers that professionals felt. Who are the right people to be involved, as this quote um, illustrates? Another clinician reflected that access to palliative care services challenged their own professional role. We know death happens, but often we see ourselves as people who can make life happen, promote and save life rather than manage death. Right through your talk, and this was a talk that was being given by one of the palliative care um, clinicians, I had vacillating feelings, said this respondent. In response to some of these questions, the presenters um, uh, talked about how they saw palliative care. Just because you refer somebody for palliative care input doesn't mean to say that you're giving up on them or that you wouldn't escalate care. 20 to 30% of what I do is care for dying children. The rest of the children are expected to live for months, if not years. And that's actually a bigger part of the palliative care workload of the people that were speaking at this education and study day. So what was the impact for those attendees on coming to a very short educational intervention and hearing about more about the philosophy and the practices of palliative care and also hearing about what resources were available. So what new learning happened pre and post the survey? Well, as one might hope, there was an increase in knowledge about both resources and services. So people felt more confident about their knowledge related to the services of um, uh, uh, palliative uh, care. They reported that that increased knowledge would also increase their confidence in actually making a referral to a palliative care um, service. 90% reported that they had now had enough information to refer to a tertiary-based service, 87% more enough information to refer to a children's hospice, and 81% to refer to a local palliative care service. Less than half of the respondents had felt confident before the education session.
What about attitudes to um, palliative care? Well, one of the things that we saw that was quite interesting in the study was the shift in attitudes towards palliative care and the scope of palliative care after they've been um, uh, attending uh, the session. And that less, fam less of the respondents felt that referring babies to palliative care services too early would actually result in undermining um, parental hope. And they'd also shifted their views in relation to the span of care that they expected palliative care to be involved in. And less focus was on end-of-life um, care. And there was also an increase in the opportunities that they saw for integration post-attendance of the um, education session. So just as a summary here, symptom management as the main goal was actually reduced post. So we're starting to see an expanded um, definition of palliative care, primarily about the end of life, was also reduced um, uh, post, and the referral to palliative care undermining parental hope was less likely to reduce post. We also saw this reflected in some of the comments that we had from our um, respondents when we asked a particular question in the survey, which was, what comes to mind to you when you think about palliative care? We had 45 matched pairs of respondents who actually answered this question. We had some consistency in the responses um, there when they talked about how this might be um, uh, defined, both pre and post. Interestingly, the majority of respondents pre the study talked about the association of palliative care as being associated with dying, death, end of life. And that was 62 of the respondents. Post only 13 of the respondents used that terminology. And if I show you the next slide, oops, gone too fast. We can see that for some respondents, and that was 31 about over the, out of the 45 match respondents, there was a shift in their emphasis. So there was a shift to move away from a focus on death and end of life care towards enhancing life for neonates and their families, and integrating palliative care as part of a more holistic treatment plan from diagnosis. And I think if we look at these definitions, we can see that Respondents, when they reported their attitudes and views post the um, uh, education intervention, that they're more aligned with these definitions of perinatal um, palliative care. So in summary, what did we achieve by this very short educational intervention? We showed that we were able to... Um, deliver education for perinatal palliative care that was actually accessible to nurses. I don't think we made it particularly accessible to medical staff. We had much fewer numbers of medical staff attending, and we've actually tried to change that in our um, uh, next um, intervention that um, we've started doing. We showed that a short session could increase knowledge on services and expand some participants' concepts of palliative care. We showed there was increased confidence and that participants identified both professional and structural barriers to accessing services. What, families, uh, what the participants also identified as an additional learning need that we didn't meet in the sessions was further education was required on working with parents, identifying that as a learning need. 
So we've changed that in our um, new um, deck. So what are the implications for the future? We've retained the local focus because accessibility to education was one of the important things that we thought was successful about this program. We've changed the session slightly to include more opportunities for discussion so that the participants have more time to discuss the barriers that they're actually facing and how they can actually work with some of the challenges that they're having in making these um, decisions. We try to broaden the participation by having accreditation from both the Royal Colleges of Nursing and the Royal Colleges of um, Pediatrics. And we've recognised that not everybody can either access this type of session or actually does their best learning from sitting and um, listening or attending. So we've increased the accessibility of some of the resources that are available um, online. Uh, and I thought I'd just show you, if I can, oh, yeah. um, something that can um, be accessed. This is the um, London Neonatal um, uh, Network Organization. And this has a specific section in it for complex and palliative care. And it's an open um, forum. Anybody can access this. And there's a drop-down menu there. And within that drop-down menu, there are a number of resources, all these publications that have come out in the last, um, many of them in the last five years, are accessible um, uh, there for uh, people to um, look at. We've also tried to help people on the ground by giving access to the local resources that are available in this interactive um, uh, map, which is on the neonatal um, uh, analysis unit. So wherever you are in the UK, you can um, look on this map, click on the area that you're in, and identify local palliative care services immediate to your neonatal um, uh, unit. So what about the future for education? I've described to you today one very small um, educational um, intervention. In addition to that, going forward, one of the things that we've identified is that we need to think about future curricula, both undergraduate and postgraduate um, curricula for um, neonatal palliative care. One of the things that we need to be sure of, that not only can we have um, learning opportunities and education for um, uh, students and for um, practitioners, but those practitioners need to have the courage and opportunity to innovate to meet the needs of the evolving neonatal population. Because I think how how well our other speakers this morning have illustrated that change is going to come and we need to be ready for those changes. One of the very interesting discussions that happened in our um, education program was on the issue of um, home births for um, babies diagnosed with a fetal anomaly. And a couple of midwives started a discussion about, well... Have we ever had a, a, a birth, a delivery in a children's hospice? And it's very interesting to track those discussions across a number of the um, uh, education sessions because the respondents um, who were doing the teaching of the sessions, the first time, are like, oh, that's never happened. And then it gets asked the next time, and it's, well, it hasn't happened, but maybe that's something that we might think about. Are there midwives in the room who might want to think about um, uh, that? And so we can see that as care evolves, then we're going to need new education programs to meet those um, needs. We've got a few suggestions here, which I'm not um, going to go through, because I'm kind of conscious of um, the time. 
because I think I should be wrapping up fairly soon um, to get ready for the uh, next speaker and everybody's probably getting ready for thinking about their lunch as well. So we have some suggestions for the co appropriate content of um, undergraduate um, education about the need to understand both the philosophy and the benefits of early eligibility and referral to um, services, as well as knowing about what local services are actually um, uh, available. And thinking about, for postgraduate education, acquiring skills in clinical leadership and the ability to support clinical research. At the very beginning, I think I mentioned that one of the things that we don't know, we don't have enough information about what educational interventions work. We certainly also don't have enough information about what clinical ed uh, interventions work and about how supportive care works for the babies themselves, for their parents, and how delivering that supportive care works for healthcare professionals. And so in postgraduate education, we need to include that, think about that um, as well. And then finally, thinking as well about managing the symptoms associated um, with um, uh, neonatal life-limiting conditions across the illness um, trajectory. So in conclusion, competent practitioners in neonatal palliative care possess knowledge, attitudes, skills, and behaviors to support quality of life. One of the things that we actually didn't find out in our um, study, which was an important uh, question that we're going to go on to uh, look at, is people reported a change in attitude, but did that report of a change in attitude actually lead to a change in behavior in terms of referral processes and engagement with palliative care um, services. We have managed to track in our service an increase in referrals, but of course we can't assume causality in relation to education um, uh, for that. We think that um, uh, training in neonatal palliative care should be mandatory and meet um, accepted um, national um, standards. I think I'm going to finish there and say thank you very much. There are some contact details if you'd like to get in contact with me or anybody at the um, Louis Dundas Centre. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.